Oh. I'm sorry. We can certainly hear you. We can hear everything going on in your classroom. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop and back up, y'all. Okay, if I back up just a little bit. So let me help you see what we're doing here, Mary, because this hasn't changed that much up here. What I've been telling everybody in the room is that we are looking at all of this, and I'll clean up the video, by the way. Mm -hmm. We're looking at all this through this very simple statement that Bullen puts out here on the tech integration. Integration technology and pedagogies to maximize learning must meet these four criteria. This is the journey that I'm taking you on are these criteria here. In other words, we're going to understand how to make things irresistibly engaging, elegantly efficient. He calls that the skinny. Um, technologically ubiquitous. It's always out there. It's, it's available anytime. And then down here where it says steeped in real life problem solving to my folks that are sitting here in the room who for the most part are math and science elementary teachers, I have things to show them that are very specific to them. Okay. That's good. So now she quit stop me from carrying on like that. Y'all should do that. I said, hey Steve, shut up. All right. So what we're gonna do now, Mary, and I'm gonna need you to give me some feedback, is we're gonna start looking at the people that Fullen talks about in this first couple of chapters, in two and three. Because in those chapters, he introduces a lot of names. He's a shameless name dropper. Mm -hmm. and I think it's really important for you to hear these people as well as just read about them. So let me introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan was really famous in the late 60s and early 70s. Look at that date up there, you all. Mm -hmm. Marsha McLuhan on education in 1967. This is a program that ran on NBC on Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, who, who's going to watch it you know, on regular time? Um, and they had a, uh, were, had a whole show about the impact of television in education. I was telling them, Mary, that the late, last great war that went on in technology and education was blackboards. Hmm. Because people thought that the blackboards made teachers lazy because they could put everything on the blackboard and then just sit down and kids had to write it all down. Oh, gosh. Uh, I told them a story about the corollary to that was I got involved with the school that the, the fight was over getting rid of the blackboards and putting in whiteboards. It's fascinating. Hmm. But McLuhan was talking at the time, not just about tech, television and, and teaching, because that was a big thing, too. I come from a time when I sat in a room with 250 other people, 250 other people, and they had giant 27-inch television sitting up in the corners. There's one here, one there, one there, one there. The room is big as this. Not that there. We all sat in the regular desk. There wasn't anything different about how the room looked. We all sat in regular desk. But then they would go up and they would turn on Senorita Robinson and she would teach us Spanish. Or they would turn on um, Mrs. Somebody, Gordon, and she taught us Algebra 1. That was considered quite fancy back then. And when the telecast was over, of course, there was this time when the telecast was over that you did all of the, you know, passing the notes and flirting and everything else you would do in a room with 250 other people. And then the teachers that were in the room with you basically then had to get crowd control back. You know, come here, quiet now, please. So they were up at a, they were out of a microphone, which was about down there where the desk is. And here we are, if all of us, if you were A, B, C, and D last name, of course, you sat over there, didn't you? If you're the S, T, U, V, W group, you were over here. And that poor lady was up there trying to manage this massive amount of people. Well, McLuhan was very much a critic of television. His famous line is, the medium, the medium 
meaning television, is the massage. Now, he was a huge, huge fan of puns. Um, if you know anything about British comedy, and he's very much a Brit, even though he lived in Canada, if you understand anything about British comedy, they love their puns. So he was very much a punster. And so what he was trying to do here was play a little bit with the idea of massage and message. The massage is we are being influenced by television. Now, we look back on that now as very quaint because we understand that that's a reality now. You know, we now talk about a reality TV presidency. We talk about anything that happens in terms of reality TV. So let me let you listen to a voice from 1967. And I'm going to turn the sound up a little bit. Mary, what we've done is I've got two speakers sitting here, uh, like almost right next to the microphone. So you let me know if it works or not. Okay. Y'all ready? The electronic environment makes an information level outside the schoolroom that is far higher than the information level inside the schoolroom. In the 19th century, the knowledge inside the schoolroom was higher than the knowledge outside. Today it is reversed. The child knows that in going to school he is, in a sense, interrupting his education. Education must shift from stenciled instruction to discovery, probing and exploration. The young today want roles. They want total involvement now, rather than just fragmented, specialized jobs or goals. How can our youth look forward to a specialized job? when the computer world of automation may eliminate that job. Are you blown away by that as I am? 1967. You weren't even born. I was sitting in that big, huge classroom at Seneca High School in 1967. So here this guy is. Hey, Mary, could you hear him, by the way? Yes, I could. Okay. So here he is, he's saying that in 1967. It's almost sad if you think about it, because it's the same thing we're saying again and again and again, all down through. And the whole thing about kids outside of school are getting more information than when they're in school. Well, that's something we're saying over and over again now, too. Let me introduce you. I'm going to let you hear Mike. I'm sorry, Dr. Fullen. Um, he's a bit dry. Just to let you know. In communication, creativity, collaboration, character education, and citizenship. How does technology uh, relate to those? I'm going to call those six the deep learning goals. And the answer is yes. I'm going to back him up. As a community member, we'll let her finish, and then I'll, kind of I'll let him go. As a person. Listen to what he's saying to you, because what he's talking about is what's now being talked about in Jefferson County. I don't know about Florence, Kentucky, but everybody is on this deep learning bandwagon. You all talking deep learning up there, kid? Yeah. Okay. Here's the guy who made it up. As we go deeper into learning, uh, can technology uh, accelerate and, and deepen the quality of learning? And in fact, the answer is yes, although not automatically yes, and that's what we're starting up. We have these uh, six C's, they're called, that will be familiar to most people, uh, critical thinking, communication, creativity, collaboration, character education, and citizenship. How does technology uh, relate to those? I'm going to call those six the deep learning goals. And it turns out that if you purposely use technology, you can go a long way to accelerate it. So. We have certain criteria. How does the learning become irresistibly engaging? Students want it, uh, and teachers want it. Uh, how does it how does it get used without getting too complicated technically? So second one, uh, how do you use technology 24/7? So you're accessing the information purposefully all around the clock, and then also how do you do work that's steeped in what we call real life problem solving? So the pull factor is the tremendous digital world that's got all kinds of ever increasing attractions. Uh, not all of which is productive, but it is a pull. It is now so attractive, so seductive, 
so available, so sophisticated, so uh, kind of uh, pervasive in both in its presence and what it can access that you just, uh, everybody sort of grows up on that. And then it's a question of how do we, how do we not get overwhelmed by it? Uh, we, we have a phrase, when something is that powerful, you want to figure out how to move towards the danger and figure out how to get it on your terms. Yeah, I'm going to stop you there because you can see what you see in the... 25 minutes. Remember what I told you about this video? I found so humorous. He's an alley down there. He's where the pub is that he would hang out in. <laughs> That's a college of education there at Toronto. So did you hear what he was saying? We've got, we've got two things going on here. We have this overwhelming ability to do so many different things now with technology. We're going to come back to this again when we talk about the heavy-duty theoretical framework that I'm going to throw at you here in a couple of weeks called PPAC. We need to see that this stuff is so confused now in our daily lives. When we first started out with computers in classrooms, in fact, we used to have a phrase we called the cow, computer on wheels. And we would have kids, we would assign a kid, honey, go get the cow. And they would go out the door and go down to the library, because that's usually where they were kept, you know, just like the old um, slide projectors that we used to have. They were kept in the library, and the kid would roll the cow into class, and we would have a panel that was connected to the computer that sat on top of an overhead projector. So the overhead became the way to show it up on a screen. We hadn't had projectors yet that could do that. So we had cows. Now, it's everywhere. And now, as he said, the danger of technology is it's so enticing and so intoxicating. It just pulls us in to exciting things as well as dangerous things. And we all know what that is because we have experienced it in one way or another. You know, I, I found it interesting that my daughter took a very innocent photograph of she and I standing on the beach and she was complimenting her daddy because he's lost over 70 pounds and he now has abs and you know he has a dad bod as she said <laughs> and she posts that to Instagram innocent right now Instagram as you all know what it is is so pervasive now and I started getting all kinds of email comments back from peers didn't know you looked that good without a shirt steve you know <laughs> you don't think about impact now about the kinds of things you do because we are so used to it being so out there you know fortunately as i said it was a fairly innocent picture it's my daughter and me standing in well we're standing in front of the gulf of mexico yeah you know, but yet Take that just a very simple step forward. Kid takes a picture of themselves, puts it on Instagram, and they're twerking or they're doing something else inappropriate. Now all of a sudden everybody can see it. And so what Fullen is trying to say is, how do we get that under control? How do we as teachers control for that kind of thing? Now I'm going to do one more in this sort of uh, anthology. Uh, people talking, and then we'll go to the bad guy. I call him the bad guy. I shouldn't call him the bad guy, but, you know, there we are. You don't want to listen to this guy. I'd have, I'd have to be out here in the audience yelling at you to wake up. Okay, let me go here. Let's see. Yeah. Ted doesn't work because of you guys in this live room in this audience. Ted works. No, no, no. Because... I don't want to hear about Ted. Thanks. We don't need to hear about Ted. Yeah, okay. This guy's Scottish accent might put you off. Psychology learning suggests that repeating access to content matters. You have learned nothing without repeated access and repeated practice. You learn absolutely nothing because Eddinghaus in 1885 showed that your skills and knowledge decay really rapidly on a single event exposure. 
you will forget almost everything I'm telling you today within 30 minutes. Now, there's been a revolution in content here as well. This is why things are so exciting okay. in terms of this revolution at the moment. We have uh, Salman Khan in the US, who has put 2,000 odd videos up, 2,800 videos under a Creative Commons license on the internet. Salman, like me, started teaching maths using Skype. Uh, eventually got stuff laid down in video. Okay, let's address that. No, no, Khan, right? Okay, He's, he was the first guy claims to be the first guy to do this and the research on it is now old enough that it has meaning the problem with all this kind of research we started looking at technology in classrooms does it make a difference back when bill clinton was governor in arkansas back then bill being bill made a deal with the legislature there in arkansas and he basically said if you let me have the money to put all this technology in schools, we'll study and make sure it works. And they did. Guess what they came up with? In conclusion, it was inconclusive. Nobody could say there was any causation. Remember, it has to have causation. This causes that. There wasn't any of that. Now, We've got Khan out there who's got all these videos. And all we have to do is say to kids, listen, honey, can you go home for a minute? Watch the Khan video and you'll get it. Yeah. Who did leave out? And we keep leaving you out. Remember we said all we had to do is put kids in classrooms with computers, park them in front of them and say, watch the lesson, watch the lesson, watch the lesson, take the test. Who do we leave out? You. Mm -hmm. The most important people, teachers. And we basically said, okay, Mr. Khan, I'll go over here and sit down now. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong, there's anything wrong with it. Although I think some of his videos suck. What I'm saying is the most important person is out of the equation. That's you just like i'm doing tonight i'm standing here and i'm showing you these videos but i'm filling it in for you you know i'm not just turn, you know it's like uh, the classic joke of the social studio unfortunately it's usually a social studies teacher uh in high school or middle school they wheel the projector in put the film on and they go sit down well in your days it was the vcr and they go sit down and they read the newspaper while you all sat there and watched a censored man or something that was on the TV. It got so bad, in fact, that the state of Kentucky basically put out an edict that said, thou shalt not use the KET system that was in, that is in every school in the state of Kentucky to show videos, films during the school day. Because again, that was an old trick that we used to do. It's like the Friday before winter break, let's put on a movie. It was always frozen, or at least Currently, it's frozen. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Or before that, it was Lion King. You know, and the state of Kentucky finally said, stop doing that. It's not what we gave you that incredible piece of technology for. We've got to realize that if we don't include you in this calculus, in this equation, Nothing really happens. This is what scares the bejesus out of me with these iPads that are going out to all these middle schools here, I think in another two weeks. A, have we helped teachers understand how to manage them when they end up in their classroom? B, have we helped teachers understand how to leverage the power that they give the teacher? Don't think they have. All right, now we're going to go down to the bad guy. I call him the bad guy. I should quit. I should quit doing that. This is Larry Rosen. You'll hear uh, Pullen. He quotes him a lot. So this is the guy that brings the bad news. And I think it's it is bad news, but it's news we all need to hear because, as I said, 
I think one of the biggest problems we have with technology and education is we as teachers are basically walking away from our obligation in letting the technology take over. What I'm going to talk about today is a couple of things. First, I'm going to talk to you about why we are all being inundated. Does his voice match his body or his face? I, I'm sorry. I just think he should be more villainous or something. I don't know. Deeper voice or something. Okay, sorry about that, Larry. With issues because technology is changing so rapidly that we can barely keep up. I'm going to talk to you about focus and attention. I'm going to talk to you about our brains from a structural level and from a biochemical level. And then I'm going to talk about how what neuroscientists know about how technology does affect our brains. And then I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of advice on how to keep your brain healthy and not support your software, not support your hardware, but support your humanware. So let's take a look at technology. Consumer scientists look at a metric called penetration rate. When a technology reaches or any product reaches 50 million users, it's considered to penetrate society. So those of us who are old enough to remember, radio took 38 years to penetrate society. The telephone took 20, television took 13, cell phones took 12, and then the World Wide Web came in and everything spiraled out of control. Four years to go from nothing to 50 million people. iPods took three years, blogs took three years, MySpace, remember that? MySpace took two and a half years, Facebook took two years, YouTube took only one year, and Angry Birds took 35 days. And in fact, what's happening now is all the new technologies that are coming in are coming in so rapidly that literally we are part of a human experiment. We are being inundated all the time, and I could have just as easily ended that with Instagram or Snapchat or Reddit or any of the technologies that within a very short period of time inundate our society. Part of what I do as a research scientist is I look at a variety of topics. And one thing I'm very interested in is how our students study. So we went into homes and sent in 279 observers to observe middle school, high school, and college students studying. We told students, we'd like you to study something truly important, really important, like studying for a test, studying for some sort of project, something that's very, very important. We wanted them to focus. And what we said is we're going to just observe you. And we sat in the background and we observed them. We looked to see, first of all, every minute for 15 minutes, were they on task or off task? Were they studying what they said or were they off task? What was on their computer screen at any given time? How much technology they use on a daily basis? We asked them questions about whether they had strategies for studying. We also asked them some questions about whether they preferred to work on something until it was done and then switch to a second task or work a little on this, switch back, forth, back, forth. Not surprisingly, they all do that. And then we also measure, asked them just what's their grade point average. So this graph shows on the bottom side, you see the 15 minutes of observations. On the left-hand side, what you see is the percentage of time on task. First thing I want you to notice is that 70% was the average they were able to do. Even though they were supposed to be studying something truly important, 70%. So for the first couple of minutes, they were focused, and then they got distracted, and then they focus again, and then they get really distracted about the eight to 10 minute mark, and then they start to focus again, but we think that's an aberration because we think they realized, oh my God, the 15 minutes is almost up. I better look like I'm studying. And you notice that at 15 minutes, they start to tail off again. Other people have found exactly the same results for medical students, computer programmers, information workers, pretty much everybody. Okay, I'm going to stop you here because I've actually done this too. One of the questions that when I first came here that my colleague, uh, Dr. Caroline Sheffield, if you ever get a chance to take a class with uh, Jeff, take it. She and I were really, she came to me because she heard that I was the, the idiot that brought uh, smart boards into Jefferson County Public Schools. That's mm -hmm. true. And so she was like, would you be willing to work with me and do a study to see the efficacy? In other words, how well do they work in a classroom? 
we did exactly, we looked at Rosen's work. We did exactly what Larry did. Okay, we went into a classroom. We went and found three kinds of teachers. You can probably guess. We found people who use smart boards as what? This thing. Projection screen. Okay. That was one kind of teacher we used smart board. We found teachers who understood how to use smart boards for like if they were doing PowerPoints. This is mostly in high school. You walk up to the screen and they go, now when we do this, you know, went to the next slide. And uh, then well in 1945, do we do it? You know, they knew how to do that. And then the third kind of teacher we looked at was the kind of teacher who actually knew how to use the software. Um, the software that comes with smart boards is called Smart Notebook. A totally unbiased, uncritical, totally neutral review of Smart Notebook is it sucks. Okay, just so you know. Um, when I first was shown Smart Notebook, I was told at the time by Smart, uh, they brought me to Calgary, Alberta. Do you know that's where it is? That's where it's located. Smart is not a United States company. Boy, I sound like Trump, don't I? It's not a United States company. It's Canadian. They took us up to Calgary, Alberta, and they wined and dined us and everything. And they said, now listen, guys, we know the Smart Notebook software is it's a work in progress, but it will get better. Oh, by the way, would you all try the wine? You get the, get the idea. You know, so it has never gotten there. But anyway, we looked at it that way. So you can imagine what it looked like in a classroom of kids who were there because it was the projection screen, right? It looked very similar to Larry's graphic he just showed you. There was a certain amount of time that people were on task, usually the teacher was talking and pointing at the screen, and then, boop, with me. And then there was this sort of like, wait a minute, what did she say or he say? Because usually the teacher said something along the lines of quiz, test, you know, so boop, and then boop. And then there was that moment, it's like he said, we don't understand why, but also, you know, the attention goes back up. Pretty well predictable for the teacher who used it as a projection screen. The second teacher who had the smart board with the PowerPoints. And this was mostly, this, is the, this was the thing we recognized right away when we did this study. We weren't good about keeping it consistent. We went to elementary school, we went to middle school, we went to high school. In other words, wherever anybody would let us in the door. In high schools where we saw the smarts being used with PowerPoints, it looked pretty much like this. Okay, in other words, it popped up, they paid attention to the beginning of the PowerPoint, and then it went and stayed there. Now, you know, we, we were like, what the hell's going on here? And we finally discovered what was going on because nine times out of 10, most high school folks have adopted the technique of a run off the PowerPoint slides. Is there a little box that you can run it off down there where you can take notes? You know what I'm talking about. And they hand them out to the kids. So is the kid paying attention up here or is he looking down there? Okay. So, you know, we, we kind of said maybe we should give them credit for, you know, looking down and taking notes. Because the teacher, when they got to the, import, the, the important slide or the appropriate slide, they would say, now write this down. Which cracked me up because right there in front of the kid on the slide is what he's being told to write down. Because we also have this myth about if you write something down. Okay, so we, we saw that. Now we got to the teacher who understood their smart board. They went to something you're going to see called Smart Exchange, where all these lessons have already been generated using smart technology. He puts in quotes. When you go look at those lessons, what do they look like? What does PowerPoint look like? The difference is some of them actually have little uh, flash apps in them 
that you can come up and manipulate on the screen. Now, when we saw teachers using it that way, we went right back to Larry's. Okay. Real indictment of that technology. Then we got a phone call from a school, Atkinson Elementary. Anybody been to Atkinson? Okay. They still have the smart boards there? Do they still have the navigators? Looks like a board about like this big that you can actually stand and manipulate the board from anywhere in the room. So it was the new, it was the latest, hottest thing. You know, smart basically gave them to us. <laughs> As I said, wow, you bought a lot of product from us. So anyway, so we were going around showing people how to use these things. So we were now coming back into classrooms, Atkinson, and we were looking at, oh, maybe this will make a difference. So again, you know, I'm hiding over there in the corner. I'm watching for on task, off task, right? That's what I, we're basing all this on. Now, of course, when you do something like this, it can be very subjective, can't it? Like she's over here drinking her drink, and she may be off task. She might be on task. How do we know you're on task, right? I mean, it's really kind of hard. High school is very easy to do this kind of work in. You know why? There's an unwritten rule in high school. When I put my head down, you don't bother me, I won't bother you. I've done hundreds of hours in high school classrooms, guys. It is a rule. And you see it right away. Kids will come in. Hi, I'm so glad you're in my class today. I really appreciate you being here. You'll see good teaching technique where they'll say hi to every kid who walks in the door. The extraordinary teachers know every kid's name, right? I'm so glad you're here today. I hope we're going to have a good day. She puts her head down. What does the teacher do? Okay, I'll talk to you now. <laughs> they just, it's the unwritten rule. Okay? You don't see that in elementary. Mm -hmm. Elementary teachers are too much like, you know, excuse me? You're ignoring me? The most important person in your life right now? <laughs> we are. We're like that. Okay? So, you know, you when you're watching this in elementary school, it's kind of tricky. But it's still there. It's still there. I mean, the kid who's sitting there, uh, you know, on the desk with the pencil or drawing the spaceships, you know, in their notebooks, you know, those are easy to spot. But usually it really ha you really have to watch eye contact. And the good teacher is that kind of person who I can't do because otherwise Mary can't hear me, wanders in and out, out there, right? They're, they're the ones who are out there doing Vygotsky like crazy. Remember Vygotsky? You all had Vygotsky? Yeah. You know, you get out there, you get proximity on kids, and they're kind of like, what are you doing here? Why are you next to me? You know? And then they catch on to the fact that you should be paying attention to what you're talking about. Well, anyway, we had those navigator things out there, those tablet thingies that they could write on. Anything Larry showed you? Here's where it changed. Here's where it changed. I was working in a school, Watterson Elementary. The principal at Watterson Elementary gave me a pass to work with the fifth and fourth grade teachers there on science because he had heard that I was, had been a I was a sort of science teacher when I was a special ed teacher I would bring my kids in I would teach science but have my kids with me because I love science it's my background and he was like okay I'll let you do it with the smart boards and you're going to teach the teachers how to use the smart boards but up and up you know and I was nodding sure yeah we would yeah. Now, here's two things that were going on in that classroom. Number one, every classroom had six computers in it along the wall. And you've probably have seen that if you've been in some schools. Because that was what we did back then. We put in six computers in every classroom. That was the Ketz vision. They weren't ever really used very much, except for... You got your work done. Good for you, honey. Go back and use the computer. 
And when, you know, the word got out that everything in JCPS was filtered, it's pretty slick that. We turned that upside down. We said to the teachers, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach the kids how to use the smart notebook software. We're going to put them into groups of five, Wi Fi. You know Wi Fi? It's called the Magic Star. What happens when you have two people working together who aren't friends? You know, think pair share. You heard of that one? You will by the time I get done with you. Think pair share means basically you two talk to each other, you two talk to each other, you two, well, you'd have to talk to Josiah, who's not here. You all talk to each other. When you get to three, what happens? Yeah. I really don't Hi, you're part of a group? Okay. You've been there. You've had it happen. When you get to five, those kind of dynamics don't really happen too much. Now, sometimes three can gang up on two, or two could just drop out altogether. But you have to be really good about assigning, you know, what are you going to do? So anyway, so we did, the, we did the star. We did the magic star. We said to them, we were studying weather. We said to them, you're going to pick a city, any city anywhere in the world. You're going to research that city. And you're going to prepare for us a weather report for the rest of the month for that particular city. We need to see the following. Weather map. Picture of the city, preferably a Google Earth. On the weather map, we want to see frontal boundaries. We want to see all the things that make up understanding weather. Boom, 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 boom. You're working together. Boom, boom, boom. You're working together. Go for it. And there's this. <laughs> what? <laughs> and so what you have to do at that point is you have to have kids use what we call the cup system. So. One, two, three, four, five. You all own this cup, which belongs to that computer over there. Talk to your group. You're going to go find out if we want to use Moscow as our city. So she goes over to the computer, sits down, puts a cup on top of the computer, sits down, puts up, you know, Moscow weather or whatever. Comes back with the cup. You see what I'm doing? So we built in the way to manage what's going on. Cup sitting on the computer. Whose cup is this? Why is it on the computer? Well, we are coming back. No. You keep the cup until you're on the computer. That's how I could manage what? A lot of kids, a few computers, although six is a lot of computers in the classroom. Now, with all the Chromebooks that are out there, it's even easier to do. You see what I did? We went from teacher-centered Listen to me, look at this, watch how I do, to kid. Now, at some point, the teacher has to get re-engaged because of that first thing that we talked about. They don't listen to her for five minutes, but she talks about frontal boundaries and what is that L with a thing around it, the A thing around it. What does all that mean? What are the triangles with the line? What do they mean? So, you know, teacher is coming in and dropping in and seeing what's happening in each of the groups. At some point, the group has to learn smart notebook, which is a pain in the royal behind. Okay? It's not that it's bad. It, no, it's not that it's hard. It's just bad. You know, you just basically go in, you can find any picture and put it in there. And so what kids were doing is they realize right away there's like 14 gazillion maps. And so then we go in, like the, the group that owned Paris. They went in and found the map in the, the smart notebook of, of France. What do they have to find out then? Where's Paris? So then when they put the Paris there, they all, they, they all did it the same way, the Eiffel Tower. Then they went in and found the weather, because there were weather uh, icons. They put those in. So they they rapidly found out where all the pieces were, especially when the, you know, the idiot from U of L was standing there. Well, I wasn't from U of L, I was from JCPS. The idiot from JCPS was standing there going, Hey guys, there's a search bar up there. Type it in. 
Use the words that your teacher has taught you. Type it in. You'll find it. We did. When it was all over with, it took a week. It took a week of science time, right? You've been in enough elementary classrooms, you know what I'm saying. And then they did presentations. And then she gave them a test. What did she give them a test over? In terms. You know, what does this mean? What does that mean? And her scores were off the charts. They were, they scored way, way higher than she thought they would. Now, when you looked at that one, it's all up here. Okay. Hey, you still caught the, you know, the kid who's sitting in the group who's like, really? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do this? You know what else you found? You'll find this all the time when you teach, by the way. You have two groups in the classroom that are hardest groups to reach. Maybe a third. Maybe a third, but I'll stick with two. There's a group over here who have a learning difficulty. They're hard to get to. But God, they want to be God. Trust me. They want to be God. They really, really do. The other group is over here. By the way, I'm doing that belt shaped curve thing. The other group is over here. The gifted and talented, the honors kids, the Oh my God, what do I do with this kid? He's smarter than me, kid. And they are just as ignored as that poor kid down here is struggling with learning difficulties. And so when you do the grouping thing, the problem is the kid who's at this end of the spectrum, the kid who's at that high end of the spectrum basically says, look, don't bother me with these other people. Just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. That shoots the heck out of everything collaborative you can do. So again, can we find ways to include all of these various different ways that people view the world and their learning? I'm going to go back to Larry now. I just wanted to make sure you realize what he's telling you is true. About a two to three to five minute focus before we get distracted. And what distracts us most? Technology. Look what happens with the number of windows that they open up while they're studying. Again, on the bottom are the minutes, on the top are the number of windows. Notice, by the way, where it peaks, which is at that 8 to 10 minute mark where they got the most distracted. They're continually opening up more windows. And in fact, the most off-task students had the most windows open. So remember I said we, we asked them to... This has been the biggest problem with Chromebooks. Why? You ever been in a Chrome browser? How easy to open multiple tabs in a Chrome browser? That's stupid. Isn't it? So when you go in classrooms where there are lots of kids with Chromebooks, what you see all the time is a Greenwood Elementary, fifth grade teacher, Stephanie Mudd, Christina Mudd. Amazing, amazing project she was doing with kids out there about Native Americans. Just amazing. And every kid in the room had a Chromebook. Every kid had a Chromebook. Of course, I'm walking around. Remember the guy I can't see. But I can sure as hell tell when you're flipping tabs. Walked around and watched how many kids were actually focused on what Miss Mudd had asked them to do. And it was very high. It was very high. Why? Because they adored her. They bought into her. I'm going to go take you on a journey. We're all going to go on this journey together, and here's what we're going to do. They were really into what she was wanting them to do because she'd set it up that way. All right. Just wanted to make sure you realize what he's telling you is true. A great point, Average. And we thought, this is crazy. From 15 minutes, can we predict who will be a better student, who will have a better grade point average? And in fact, we could. First of all, those who stayed on task longer, more of the 15 minutes, had a better grade point average. Not surprising, but nice. Those who told us they had strategies for studying had a better grade point average. That's good also. Now comes the bad news. Those who prefer task switching, working on something a little, switching to this, back and forth, worse grades. 
Those who consume more media during the day, spend more time on their phones, more time on their computer, more time on their devices, worse grades. And there was one more predictor. Remember I said we saw what was on their computer screen? Visiting one website just once in the 15 minutes led to worse grades. And Another great big myth. You know, kids today, they uh, basically are switching tasks all the time because that's the way they've grown up. They know how to do that. Wrong, 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 wrong. You know who's best at switching tasks? You are. Women your age. You are the best, absolutely the best. There's a Heck, if you want some time, I'll show you a little game. Uh, it's not game, it's like a test thing to do. And I'll let you, once we get Josiah back in here, okay? And you will realize very quickly, it's kind of like a game. You have to do something here, then go over here, and then come back over here, go back over there. And it's nothing, you know, like, um, you know, you have to find anything like that. It's just simple. It's like, here's the colors over here. What were the colors over here? Now go over there. Here's the numbers over here. What were the numbers over here? You know, it's very simple. He'll be lost after the second level. You, I don't care if he's a game player, like if he's, you know, Mr. I play games all the time. He'll be lost. You, on the other hand, you'll be at the fourth or fifth level, nothing flat. In fact, you'll be telling me, uh, should we, can we, why are we stopping? This is fun. Okay. But the bottom line is, we're not designed to be this. We are not designed to be this especially adolescents are not designed to be this. When I say adolescents, you realize I'm pushing that down into fourth and fifth grade now, right? They're, they're really becoming adolescents faster than we're, we're prepared for. So realize that. Guess what website? Facebook. If they visited Facebook just once, it didn't matter whether they visited once or 15 times, they had worse grades. It's not just students, however, who are distracted. This is a Pew Research uh, Internet in American Life project that just came out. I thought it was totally appropriate. It said 25% of couples say smartphones distract their partners. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so why can't we focus? Why can't we pay attention? What's wrong with us? Well, we're facing two problems. In the outside world, we're getting constant alerts, notifications, beeps, vibrations from our smartphones, which we all carry 24 seven, literally. And television has changed. Television used to be different. It used to be slower. And now there's quick cuts. There's, there's scrolling bars up at the bottom and the top and the side and everywhere. But inside the brain is what's happening more importantly. There's two things are going on. One, mind wandering happens. And two, the brain is always thinking. And what it's thinking is oftentimes about technology. So part of the problem is behind, right here, behind our frontal area, behind our forehead. It's called the prefrontal cortex. I'm sure many of you know this. The pre that's me having my prefrontal cortex scanned. Luckily, they found something. Um, the prefrontal cortex is very important. It is, first of all, and first and foremost, our executive controller. It is the seat of working memory. It's the seat of where attention and focus are. It's where we make our decisions. It's where we control whether we multitask or not. And importantly for young people, it's impulse control. It's controlling whether we make decisions that are not good for us. So let me talk a little bit about what we know about neurons in, in the brain and particularly in the body. When you are born, your nerve cells are like uninsulated wires. They're like wires if you strip all the coating off of it. And if you do that and then you plug something into a socket, you'll see sparks going all over the place. So this is what a neuron looks like with sparks coming out. And in fact, what happens is once you're born, you start to develop these, this coating called myelin, which are just fatty cells that wrap, start to wrap themselves around neurons and they continue to wrap themselves around neurons until you are old enough, and I'll tell you in a few minutes when you are old enough, to have all your neurons all insulated and all coded so the transmissions go from point A to point B effectively. The last area to be myelinated is right here, that exact area that your executive controller 
that's your impulse control. This chart shows that myelination, the process, is not really complete until people are in their 20s or even early 30s. And sadly, you'll notice that after about 45, it starts to go back down again, and we start to lose myelin, which, mean, which explains, by the way, why in, you'll be watching television, you'll walk into the kitchen, you'll open up the refrigerator door, and you'll say, why am I here? Hmm, why am I here? Now let's talk about myelin. One of the great things that we've discovered in educational uh, research is this. This is very important for you all. A guy by the name of Richard Mayer, who I teach in another class, was really interested in finding out how do people learn with multimedia? And he's not talking about this stuff. He does eventually. What he's talking about is what you see if you've ever been around little kids in books. Little kids in books, they have a natural tendency to want to open books and look at them. If there are pictures in that book, I'm talking now two to three year olds, four, four year olds, what they will do is they will start looking at the pictures in many stories. They're taking the cues from the pictures. Now, Kids who are further developed, if you want to use that term, will start trying to figure out the words down at the bottom. They don't know the words. They haven't been taught to code it. What they have been taught is C-A-T means cat, meow. Okay? Here's what Mayer found out. Kids who come to that task from a very limited experiential background Here's a kitty, pet it. Yeah. Here's a dog. <laughs> Let's go to the farm. Let's drive out to Prospect and go visit, what's it called? Noah's Ark, something like that? Yes. Let's go to the zoo. Myelination is going like crazy. Neuron connection is being crazy. They are building a almost encyclopedic. Here's what I've been learning about from the experiences that I've had. What are you doing, Daddy? Uh, I'm going to go change the oil in the car. You want to come along and watch? So it doesn't have to be high level intellectual stuff. I spent the best years of my life working with a great uncle in Stearns, Kentucky when my parents were trying to keep me from becoming a hippie, didn't happen, but they would send me down there to, to live with him and work on his farm. This guy taught me more about farming, taught me more about what, what the earth is, taught me more about, he would say to me things like, now, Stephen, when you're going out to the barn, if it hisses at you and rattles, you can kill it, because that's a rattlesnake. Okay. Now, Stephen, if you're going out to the barn, and it's black and it's real shiny and big, you leave that alone like a rat snake. It's taking care of all the rodents in my barn. The messages were very clear. Stay away from the hissing and the rattling and take care of the black ones. Kids who have that kind of rich experiences, I don't care if you live in poverty, if you're wealthy out the wazoo, they come to new tasks enabled. Oh, so you're saying I gotta do uh -huh, okay, yeah, I'm with you. Go watch it in your classrooms. The teacher says things like, okay, we need to go get the crayons, we need to go get the uh, glue, we need to go get the you know pencils. And most good elementary school teachers are organized that way. The kid who's never been allowed in the kitchen to help his mother cook. The kid who's never been allowed to participate in setting the table. The kid who's never been allowed to put together anything with a family. It's going to be the kid that's sitting there that's like, what? 
foot. And God helping if he's kinesthetic or she's kinesthetic on top of that, where they got to touch everything. So what we find is what Mayer found was this. The more experiences, activities that we give people to practice a skill, the more they build the connection, the myelation, that they then can build on when moving else. Now, what he found was taking the time to allow that to happen, the benefit to that group of kids that struggles, again, to use our very poor analogy, by the way, down here, that, that group of kids who struggle, boom, makes all the difference in the world, boom. The kid is up here who comes from a very experiential, rich, doesn't hurt, doesn't help, then, you know, the boy makes a difference. I know I'm, I'm kind of landed on Larry because to me, he really has the meat. It's why when you lose your keys, you keep looking in the same place over and over and over again, hoping they'll magically appear. So what does it all mean? First of all, without myelin around your nerve cells, neurons don't conduct cell signals. The last area is right up here. This is your executive controller. This is your boss. And this doesn't happen until your late 20s and even in your early 30s. We spend a lot of time studying young adults and teenagers and even preteens now in terms of their ability to focus and attend. But it's not only about the structural part, it's really more about the biochemical part. And a lot of those chemicals have to do with anxiety. Just a few statistics for you. Two thirds of all teens and young adults check their smartphones every 15 minutes or less. Even if they don't have an alert, a notification, they check them anyway. Half of those get anxious if we don't let them check in, and I'll give you a study that shows that. Three quarters of teens and young adults sleep with their phone with the ringer either on or on vibrate right next to their bed. And lest we think adults don't do that, half of all adults use their smartphone as an alarm clock. Not a very good idea. If it's your alarm clock, you get up in the middle of the night, you look at the time, and all of a sudden you get notifications and alerts coming in, and it affects your brain, and it keeps you awake. Has anybody ever felt their pocket vibrating? They've reached in, grabbed their phone, and there's nothing there. It's called phantom pocket vibration syndrome. And believe it or not, it happens to all of us. And think about the ramifications of this great human experiment. 10 years ago, if you felt a vibration down here by, <laughs> down here somewhere, what would you have done? You'd have reached down and scratched because it would have been an itch. Now we don't even think it's an itch, we think it's a message. We think something important must be coming in, something critical. So let me relate a study um, that I think is very instructive and important. We brought in 163 college students into a big auditorium. Half of them randomly got shelled into one door and they were told, go sit down, take your books and put them underneath the table, take your phone and turn it off and put it underneath the table. You can't talk, you're not allowed to, you can't be in an experiment if you talk, you can't do anything. The other half went in the other door and they were told exactly the same thing except we told them, oh by the way, give us your phone. We'll give you a claim check. So then what we did is 10 minutes later and then 20 more minutes later, so at 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and 50 minutes, we measured their level of anxiety. So what happened? Interestingly enough, it didn't matter whether your smartphone was under your desk turned off or we had it. Everybody got anxious, but some people got more anxious than others. People who were light daily phone users, meaning they could take it or leave it, they used it a little, they didn't use it all the time, if you look at their anxiety level, it was pretty flat. It didn't increase. Moderate daily phone users, little increase in anxiety in the beginning, but then they leveled off. They got used to not having their phone. What about the heavy users? Those kids, young adults who are always using their phone. First of all, they started out 10 minutes more anxious. In the first 10 minutes before we did the first measurement, they were already more anxious 
and they continued to get more and more anxious. And actually the researchers were going to go another 20 minutes, but they decided it wasn't healthy. So what happens biochemically? What's happening in our brain? Brand new study by uh, Leo Yekulis at Stanford just came out last week. And what he did is he put a device on, on people's computer screen that assessed what they were looking at at any given instant and when they switched from one screen to the next. He also had them wear a little band around their wrist that measured arousal. So first of all, he found that they switched from one screen to the next every 19 seconds. Every 19 seconds, that's astounding. And the most common switches, one in four switches, were either to email, where they spent only 40 seconds, just like dip over to email, check it quickly, or to Facebook, where they spent 78 seconds. But what happened to the arousal, which I think is much more interesting? On this graph, what you see is in the very middle is when they switched, and they measured before they switched and after they switched. Right here, at about 12 seconds before they start to switch, arousal starts to increase. What is that? Is it good arousal? Is it bad arousal? Well, interestingly enough, he divided the switches into two categories, work category and entertainment, entertainment being Facebook, games, and watching videos. And he looked at switches from work, doing work to an entertainment screen, or from an entertainment screen to a work screen. From the entertainment screen to the work screen, he found no difference in arousal, it was flat. Look at this, 25 seconds before switching from work to entertainment, your arousal level starts to go up. So people are starting to get excited 25 seconds before. How can you be working when part of your brain 25 seconds before is already getting excited about switching to Facebook, a video, or games. Gary Small at UCLA um, did some research where he compared people reading a book to people searching Google, and you can see that the brain is much more active searching Google than it was reading a book. Um, we're also starting to learn... When's the last time you did a Google search and you fell asleep? Think about that. When's the last time you read a book that you fell asleep? Isn't that interesting? I find that very fascinating. Learn from neuroscience, and, and some of these studies are in need of replication, but I'm going to try to summarize some of the things that we have learned that we know. For example, if you have more social network friends, more Facebook friends, more Instagram, whatever, people with more social network friends so show an increased size of both their hippocampus, which is the seat of memory, and their amygdala, which is the seat of emotions. People who are gamers, and most of the gaming research, by the way, is done in Asia, um, show increased activation in the striatum, which is the risk reward area, where you're weighing the risks and reward possibilities. Violent game players show increase in areas related to aggression, but also decreased emotions in the amygdala. And web addicts show increased overall activity across their entire brain, but the efficiency of the neurotransmission is not very good. So what do we need to do to stay healthy? Basically, there are three things I think we need to learn to do. We need to learn to focus attend. We need to figure out how to calm our brain, and we need to understand the choices we make. So first of all, we need to learn how to focus and attend. And how do we do this in a world that is totally involved with technology? Here's a cartoon that displays that. The parents are saying, this should be interesting, and there's three kids mowing the lawn, all texting at the same time. Is this what we need to do? It's a New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> Those of you who have dogs will appreciate that more, probably. And this is called the iPotty. It's an actual device. It was introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show this last year. And it does not come with the iPod, uh, the iPad, by the way. You have to use your own iPad. But it's designed to get little kids to focus on learning to potty train. And then is this where we're headed? You can see here somebody taking a picture of a family on vacation, and the family's not paying attention because they're all on their phones. So how do you train your brain to focus? That's a very critical thing. Think about a coffee break. Think about the old-fashioned cigarette break. We've created something called technology breaks, and they're very simple. 
We use them in schools, we use them in homes, we use them in restaurants, we even use them in business meetings. The basic idea is very simple. What I would have students in a school do is at the very beginning of class, they would take their phones, they would look for one minute. And then after one minute, the teacher would say, okay, turn your phone off, turn it upside down, put it right in front of the desk, and someone set their alarm for 15 minutes. When 15 minutes happens, it's the person whose alarm is set jumps up and yells, tech break, really loud. And that's the stimulus that everybody gets to check for one more minute. Phone upside down in front of them. So what happens to this? Well, eventually the kids develop a, a sense of, oh, this is really exciting, this really works. And then the teacher expands it to 20 minutes, and then 25, and then 30. And in most of the situations, what we do is we have start the class with a one or two minute tech break, check everything, 30 minutes of lesson, one or two minute tech break, 30 minutes of lesson, our class is over. Teachers report amazing success with this, that the kids are able to focus. Why? Because that upside down phone sends a signal that says, don't get anxious. You don't need to worry. You're going to get to check it soon. So how can you reset your own brain? Well, obviously, meditation and biofeedback does it. Nature breaks do it. We know that walking outside in nature for just five minutes resets and calms your brain. Listening to music, looking at art, particularly art that you find attractive and beautiful, calms your brain. Exercise calms your brain. Laughing calms your brain. Taking a hot bath calms your brain. You know the old adage, you get your best ideas in the shower? Turns out hot water calms your brain. Talking live to a friend, as long as it's a positive conversation, calms your brain. You can't talk to somebody and have an argument because that activates your brain. Practicing a foreign language calms your brain. Playing a musical instrument calms your brain. How often do you have to do it? About five to 10 minutes every two hours seems to be efficient way of calming and relaxing your brain. It's also about what we call metacognition. Knowing how your brain works, that's very important. Whenever I talk to groups of children from three years old on up, I talk about their brains and what goes on in their brains. Knowing how you best work in an environment with technology and knowing when your brain is overloaded and how to calm it down. So I advise something called, very simple called the ABC method. A, be aware of the options. Know what distracts you. If your phone distracts you, put it away. If email distracts you, like me, turn it off. If notifications bother you, turn them off. Be breathe, calm, relax, reset your brain often. About every 90 minutes to two hours, reset your brain. And finally, make good choices, good metacognitive choices. Don't keep switching your focus from one thing to the other. Try to learn to focus for 15 to 30 minutes at a time. You will be far better off. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Now, I know I kind of painted him as the villain, but what I really want us to take away from this is a couple of things. So let me pull the mic back up. What Larry is trying to get us to realize is, is there's real ramifications for what's happening out there. And it has real ramifications for us. We are not going to win this war, folks. Technology is always going to be ahead of what we have available to us in the classroom. What we have to do, and he gets to it at the very end, so I hope you picked up on it, because here it comes again. We have to help kids become very metacognitive. There's another term. Kids need to understand their epistemic agency. What does all that mean? Have you ever noticed I don't ever bring my phone in here? I'm, I'm practicing what that guy preaches. But if we can get kids to understand that these things are tools. Go back 25 years. Go back 25 years. <laughs> Were you born? Go back 25 years. Go into a classroom. Watch what's going on. What a lot of technology. There are pencil sharpeners. There are pencils. There are scissors. There is paper. 
Where the kids are doing. I mean, I would be sitting in a classroom watching somebody teach. And again, what am I looking for? I'm looking for that kid who has to go sharpen his or her pencil every five minutes. You still see it. That's that kid aesthetic. Before there was ever computers in classrooms, this stuff is going on. Okay. The good teachers, the good teachers, the very best teachers, institute channels for that kind of thing so that it doesn't become a war. Because you will always lose wars in classroom. You'll never win a war in a classroom. Now, you can lord over kids. There was a principal, who I won't mention the name, in a school that you all have gone to, who used to stand in hallways. He's like 6'4". He would stand in the hallway, and there'd be this little first grader, you know, who was acting out. He'd be standing there like, I expect you to, you know. And this little kid's just like, eh. The little kid goes back in the classroom. He's good for about 30 minutes. But then the, the memory of that guy in the hallway kind of yeah. leaves right back to it. But if we can teach kids that these things are tools, and this is when we use the tool, best social studies middle school teacher all my life. Last year. We was at a middle school where most people would say, if I say the name of the middle school, they'd go, oh, geez. I don't want to ever teach there. Homestead North. It's made up of all boys. It's very, very ethnically diverse. Unfortunately, it's also very tribal. That's not a sling. That's a truth. You've got your guys over here that are Hispanic that live in the Americana apartments who are already being encouraged to join this gang or that gang. You've got your Vietnamese kids who also live in the Americana apartments. Same thing. So it is a tough, tough place to work with them. The district's original idea was, well, by God, we're going to go in there and we're going to show these little SOs that they're going to either toe the line or they're going to... So they went in and they, they adopted a very strict dress code. Like that really changes anything. So, you know, the kids are supposed to come to school with a tie on and a shirt buttoned up. You get the idea. And for a while there, they had the code was, you know, khaki pants, blue or white shirt, tie. Now, I spent a lot of time at this place because it was one of those places where I landed as the guy in charge of instructional technology because, again, Let's put a lot of technology in school. I'll take care of those kids. They'll be excited. They'll want to do it. Of course, who do we leave out again? Who do we forget? You, the teacher. So now they're in this tug of war with the kids. That went on for about five years. Scores kept doing this. We just need to go in and be harder on those kids. They're just hired a new principal. I consider him a friend now. The first thing he said to his staff was, why do we have this dress code? Well, it's to keep the kids in line. They're, they're not in line. <laughs> they're crazy. Oh. So did he get on the Dear Congo, by the way, the dress code's gone. No. If you were a kid and you came to school without a tie, you went to Mr. Rogowski's office. Robert Rogowski, the principal. And he gave you a Rush Limbaugh tie. You know what Rush Limbaugh ties look like? You ever seen one? They're like crazy loud, you know, big pattern ties. It's nothing like the, you know, red black, red, striped tie. It's big, loud, crazy ties. He gave him one of those. Not as a punishment. Now, kids see those crazy ties, and they're like, where'd you get that tie? Mr. Rodowski gave it to me. Oh, 
Now they go home and they start digging through their parents, their dad's closet, and they find those horrible ties we all own. I have quite a few. Thank you very much. <laughs> and they start wearing those to school. Now, Radowski, again, does he get on the intercom? I quit wearing the tie. No. No. Slowly, slowly, he introduces into the culture of the school, number one, humor. Number two, a, re a reluctance to criticize. Now, I'm not saying the guy would let stuff slip. I mean, the times I were there, I saw my plenty of my share of fights in the hallway, and they were taken care of. But because the school began to embrace its community, now, they're going to get a whole bunch of technology. Kids are going to be given iPads in that building. And I'm coming back. The best teacher I ever saw teach social studies in middle school. He's going to be a, one of our PhD students. Thank God. Her name is Amanda Lacey. You won't ever get a chance to be with her. I wish you could have. Because boy, she knows how to do it. She did exactly what he did. You got one minute. Get your phones out. Get it over with. That's how she would talk to him. Get it over with. Don't send anything I wouldn't send. Ho, 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 this way. She never monitored that. Did she ever get burnt? Yeah, she did. We're going to jump so-and-so in the hallway after lunch. X. Every 15 minutes, she gave him a break. Now, by the time I got to be with Amanda, it was 30. Her teaching was so engaging, unlike mine, that the kids were always right there with her. Every word that woman said. She had this amazing pattern. Should we, should we do up here? You know, now the thing I need you to know about is this, 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 and this. Then she dropped down here. She would deliberately lower her voice down here and she would tell Joe about what she just taught. She had this amazing repertoire. Now, it got by the guys at first, but after a while, they started really leaning in to listen for when Miss Lacey dropped that voice because they knew she was going to say something funny. We come back to this. The integration of technology and pedagogy to maximize learning must meet four criteria. It must be irresistibly engaging. This is cool. I want to use this. It must be elegantly efficient. Remember Steve's law. If it takes you more than 15 minutes to explain to a group of kids how to use a piece of technology, don't use it. Why is that? Where do you come up with the 15 minutes? What did Hoosie just tell you? After 15 minutes, what happens to our attention span? Okay. They should be challenging, but easy to use. Watching kids learn how to use Chromebooks in Wii video is an amazing thing to watch. Because it can be a very difficult thing to use. But if you go in and show them the basics of it, and then get the heck out of their way and let them figure it out, what you're going to do with a picture chart here just a minute. It must be technological ubiquitous. Google Classroom. Google Classroom. And it must be steeped in real life problem solving. That's where you, as the educator who is highly trained in your content area, must make that step. I can give you all the crap in the world that is supposed to fix kids' inability to multiply by parking them in front of a computer for a half an hour every day. I'll get them, I'll get them up to knowing their multiplication tables, and I'll get them up there pretty fast. It works. What doesn't work? I have a box of 20 cookies, and there are five kids in the room. How many cookies can each of us have? Who? What's five times four? Forty. Okay, let's do it again. I have a box of 20 cookies, and there are five kids. How many can we have? Who? Okay. Two. Three times. 
All right. So what are we going to do? We're not going to read tonight. Yeah, we're not going to let you go. I would like to do this. I mean, I'll show you pictures first. Show you how it works. It's super simple. Can we agree that next Monday night we will be very, very, very much into rule number one? And here's how it's going to play out. I'm going to expect you to go in now and read chapters two and three. Oh, look. To put, to put the exclamation point on Dr. Rosen, my Chrome is popping up notifications. Rule number one. You come in here next week, you read, you build, you post. What if you do it better at home? Can you stay home? What will be the expectation of the following Monday? The red and post. And this is how I'll know. I'm going to show you how to do this tonight, too. So when I see you, I'll, if I see you next week, great. We'll talk. But I'll primarily let you read and work. But I'll be here because if you need that assurance, Steve, I don't remember how to do this infographic thing in picture chart. Sure, fine. I'm going to show you. But I'm not going to stand here and talk to you like I did tonight. That's not what we're doing next week. Now, if you want me to come out there and talk to you about how to do it, fine. If you two guys want to talk to each other about what you're doing, fine. I don't care. All right. But when I see you again, right here will be everybody's little infographic. And then we'll do a little debrief on that. And we do chapters four and five. This is the bad news, like I told you. Four and five is where Mike basically says, well, here's the good news. Four and five, I'm just going to get to you. Go do it. Go do it. Because by then, you know the skin. You know how it works. And I don't need to stand here and blather on at you. So let's go look at pick to chart. One of the things that I strongly urge you to do when we use this piece of software is to log in as me. You've been doing this a lot. And the reason is because when you log in as me, you get the full product. You know, you don't get just certain things. What's wrong? I don't see module one on here. What do you mean you don't see like, it? What you see, it's, all, it's, it's not on here. Can we also can you see module one at all? I see module two, but not module three. All right. Hold on. Mary, can you see module one? I can't. Can you see module one now? You might have to refresh your screens. Yeah. Hey, Mary, did you get that text back that I wrote you today about the problem they're having with uh, Blackboard? Um, no, I didn't. Okay. So the deal is, if you're trying to access Blackboard through a mobile device, iPad, phone, Android, tablet, whatever, it ain't working. Oh, okay. So now we see something else that had happened. Yeah, can everybody see it? Yeah. Thank you, babe. So pick the chart. We're going to log in as little old me. It's down here underneath all the videos. And there's the link. You see it? It's right here where it says Module 1 Book Study, Mike Full and Stratosphere. I'm going to click on that link. And it's going to pop me over to here. I you know you're there. Now, 
picked a chart, that's the real name, makes a whole bunch of different stuff. Okay, so the first thing we need to be careful about is you stay on infographics. Because you can make presentations, you can make all kinds of crazy things. It's a really nice little program. Um, I have seen teachers use this. And again, you now have the keys to the kingdom. Could you let kids use this at your school? Please do. It's not going to hurt anything. I guess if they go in here and make a infographic about you know the best way to blow up the school i shouldn't say <laughs> but you get what i'm saying you can't hurt anything here so we're going to go up there to where it says log in we can all do this at the same time and we're going to log in using stevie's little login okay so the username is my email address. So that is sbswan02 at louisville.edu. sbswan02 at louisville.edu. Okay, you with me? And the password is ulit241, all lowercase, lowercase, ulit241. You'll be using this a lot, okay? You'll be playing with a lot of stuff. And you'll be using this sbswan02 at louisville.edu, password ULIT241, and a lot of stuff. Um, if you're going to work with this at home, I'd go ahead and check that box right below there. It says, remember me. And that way you won't have to keep doing this. I'm going to sign in. Can you see that people have been using this quite a bit? Those are folders for kids work. I'm going to go up here where it says create new. And this is what I meant. You see, there's all kinds of different things you can do here. You've got infographics, you've got presentations. And then these are the ones that a lot of people will use out in their schools for the simple reason that what it can do is it keeps it very simple, then it can print them and then put them up and do gallery walks. Well, we're gonna do a gallery walk, but we're gonna do it using the padlet. Same idea. So I'm gonna click over here where it says infographic. Okay. U-L-I-T, all lowercase, 241. What was the email again? I'm sorry. No problem. It is S, B as in boy, S W A N 02 at louisville.edu. Okay. I want to show you this before we go too much farther. If you go up here and click on the upper left where it says dashboard, and you see all these folders and everything. If you scroll down past that, I mean, feel free to open the folders and look. But if you scroll down past that, you could see examples of what people have done. You know, so if you're the kind of person, I am, who likes to see examples so I can know what it is that other people are thinking, it kind of gives me a way to kind of jump off. Here they are. Okay. Um, don't necessarily steal them, in other words, because you could just see, I can go right here and edit, and here I go. I can work with this one. But you definitely can see ideas about how to do this. So 
Now I'm going to go over here and click on infographic. If I go to the pro templates, I get everything. Now, if that's a little overwhelming to you, feel free to go back and do just the free. They're pretty limited, but still that's pretty much the thing. So the, what they're doing here is they're giving you an example, a layout. And then all you have to do is basically find the one that sort of fits your thinking about what we have read and what you've heard. Okay. And so like this one over here that says healthy living tips. Well, if that kind of goes click in your brain, basically, you know, what we heard from Larry, then I'm going to go, I'll use this template. And then it comes up. And now, folks, it's PowerPoint. It's PowerPoint time. And you know what I mean by that? If I click in this box, it says healthy living tips. All of a sudden now I can write in this box and I might change this to where it says I'm going to move my cursor in front of here chapter two and three S T R A T O S P H E R E a little big, but I, I can fix that too. And then I can come down here and again put my cursor out here. Healthy computer living. Okay. Now, right off the bat, you're going, uh, Steve, that's huge. That's fine. I'll just highlight it. It's PowerPoint, kids. It's PowerPoint. I'll come up here to where the font size is and I can change it down. You can see how big it's going to be. It shows you what it's going to look like. And I can change it down to the size that I think fits it. And again, I could fix it there. Okay. Now I like this star looking thing. So I might just hang on to that. We've got another box here. Same thing. I can go in, highlight all of this. And now I can start putting in my thinking about what I've read, what I saw what I heard about chapters two and three. Okay. You see how it gives you lots of ideas to jump off from. Now, if you want to put your own stuff in it over here, you've got shapes and icons lines, photos, photo frame. So you can click on that and it'll drop down and it will show you what it has available. You can do searches. If you're looking for photos of computers, it'll find those for you. Let me give you a hint. Notice that over here are lots and lots of uploaded images from the what? six to seven to eight years worth of this class. So you'd be shocked <laughs> what you can find is somebody's already gone out there and done looked for you. you do searches, you know, everything that you're used to doing is right here under uploads, under graphics. Like I said, you can search. How do you do the boxes with the text? Well, you can either do a text box and here they are. So here are kind of the looks that you might want to drag into it. Okay. And now you have something to write within. You might want to make it bigger. You know how to do that. You drag it. Now you can type in here. What if you don't like something? What if you want to get rid of something? How do you get rid of stuff in PowerPoint? You click on it, you highlight it, and you go bye and backspace it, delete whatever your keyboard has. Now, if this really bothers you, if it really bothers you, you can do one from scratch. 
let me drop back into that real fast and then I'm going to show you something you got to make sure you do. So if I wanted to, I can just go back over here and there's like a little plus sign thing and I can just say, hey, uh, let me just make my own because Steve showed me now how I can go in here and just do my own thing. That's fine. Okay. I'm trying to find where that is. It's down here somewhere. It's just a big empty space with a big plus sign. Does it do it there? Yeah. Okay. Right here, right here? Yeah. yeah. Hold on. There it is. Thank you, babe. So, you know, if if you this is very confusing to you, here, just go. So why do you want to put into this? How many pictures? All right. I'm kicking you up the steps, kids. I'm kicking you up Bloom's lap. I want you to think. I want you to think. I want you to make your point. Don't regurgitate back to me. Please don't. Now, if you want to regurgitate back with something funny about it, in other words, put Rosen up here and, you know, label him the villain or something like that, fine, go for it. I've had folks do chapters two and three, and they do sort of a Star wars -y kind of thing. It's usually guys that do that one. You know, fine. But don't regurgitate. Think. Find something in there that makes you go, huh, focus on that. I don't need you to tell me what's in two and three. I've read it uh, probably 20 times, so I know what's in it. What I want you to do is I want you to find something in there that makes you go, huh, and focus on that. Well, what, what if it's just one thing in chapters two and three, Steve? Good for you. Good for you. I'd rather you be doing that than giving me this sort of, on chapter two, so-and-so said this. Don't, don't do a mic on this, okay? Don't tell me. Now, if you find something in what somebody said and you want to highlight it and expound upon it, good for you. Good for you. Do that. So let's review. We get back in here next week. We'll be in full lab mode. And rule number one will be fully in place. She likes working at home. It's her computer. And she's doing something new with the computer and she's kind of not picking it. She's doing something new with the computer, and she's like, I would like to be at home because I know what my job is going to do at home. I know what, you know, you know what I'm saying. We all are like that. I'm like that. You know, me coming in here and running these classes, when you aren't here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm in here all by myself, and there's like 20 and 18 people out there in the great beyond, like Mary is. And I sit here, and I pray for somebody to come through that speaker up there and talk to me. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, I'm just sitting up here in a room with that in front of that. And I finally have gotten this computer to the point where it's comfortable for me to sit here in front of it. So you not being here, doing this at home is fine. But if you like a lot of folks, coming here puts you into the right frame of mind and you're here. Plus, I'm here. You can ask all those questions about, will you look at this and make sure it's right? Now, let me do the final steps, but we'll go over this next week as well. When I make an infographic, let me just grab one here. Let's grab this stratosphere one right here. I'm going to go ahead and grab it as an edit. In other words, if I wanted to, I could jump in here and do stuff with it. I won't. But one of the things that you want to make sure you do is, see up here where it says saved? You want to make sure you save your infographic with a name. Now, it can be something as simple as Steve's infographic, Jennifer's infographic, okay? Doesn't have to be fancy dancy. Just give it a name. Why? Because if you save it, I mean, if you don't do that and then you walk away from it, it goes bye bye. Yeah. You might want to put something a little more unique in there, too, like your full name, because there's a lot of Jennifers who worked in this thing. So you, you want to do that. And then next week, what I'm going to show you how to do is the easy part. You go over here to share. 
You want to make sure that anyone can see this. You notice it's a drop down menu right there. See, we don't want to make sure we want to make sure anybody can see it. And then what we do then is we copy the link. So, and we're going to put that link over into two places. Place number one is your Google Classroom. You're going to make your first announcement. And in that first announcement, you're going to say, here's my pictograph, picture chart, excuse me, my infographic about chapters two and three. Put your phone down there. The second place <laughs> I'll put it. Sorry. Okay, I'll show you how to put it over into live text. But you already can just how to do that, can't you? Now, let me tell you a little something about live text right now. I have to joke because I, I kind of gloss on to live text. Live text is stupid. <laughs> okay, live text is stupid. So when you copy an URL and you put it into live text, it doesn't come in as an URL. This comes in as a string of letters. You with me? Normally when you put something somewhere else, uh, it's smart enough to go, oh, that's a website? Fine. I'll underline it and I'll make it blue. So if he passes his you know, mouse over it, it'll light up and he can go there. My text doesn't do that. Not a problem. What I do is when I want to go look at your work, I go in, I highlight it, and I right click on it and say open a new tab. So don't freak. When you put stuff into live text, you go, that's not a link. It's not a, oh, don't fail me. Just put it in there and you're good. Now, for this first assignment, we're going to be putting in two links, aren't we? We're doing chapters two and three. We're going to do chapters four and five. Questions? I did a lot of talking at you. Gotcha. So we're doing a um, picture chart for each of the Two, three represents the challenge. Four and five is the promise. So if you title it chapter two and three, scary stuff, so I'm done, then I'm fine. The other thing we'll do is I will show you how to put it into Padlet next week if you don't have one yet. I'll show you how to put it into Padlet, and then that will be our gallery walk. So when we come back in the following week, we'll look at our, at our gallery walk. All of us can look at the gallery walk. So we can see what one thing she found, one thing she found, one thing you found that made you go, huh, in chapters two and three. The thing I want you to carry away tonight, a lot of crap flew out this screen at you, is the following. The most important person in any classroom is you. What Fullen says is we have to leverage the capacity that you have for teaching, because there's this understanding, and we're going to talk about this when we get into TPAC, there's this understanding that you understand your content. The most important thing that we can be doing is helping you make that content available to kids in that elegantly efficient manner, in that ubiquitous format, because it's coming from you, kids will pay attention. When I get to Buncee, which is about four modules later, you're going to fall out of your chairs and do the greatest thing you've ever seen. Because it gives you a chance to capture, to capture what you're trying to do in a classroom without all the distractions. And you know what I mean. Yes, honey, you don't have a pencil here. No, what was I talking about? You can capture what you're trying to do and put it in the classroom. Actually, did a study on that. Uh, talk to geometry teachers. Now, geometry teachers are some of the hardest things, our hardest people working out there. Because most kids who end up in geometry, it's not because they want to be there in high school. Because, you know, and everybody has to have geometry. So put them in. Those folks, what we worked on was how do you capture what you do? then has impact on kids. 
And so people did what I'm doing up here. They would run something like a screen capture tool with a microphone and they'd talk and then put the whole thing on the web. All 45 minutes of yak, 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 yak. We did that. And then we showed teachers how to capture things down to here. Do you know how long it took a good teacher to explain what they were trying to teach in any one class? No more than nine minutes. If you're just by yourself. This is what I want you to know. Talk, talk, talk. Nine minutes later, you're done. During the 15 minutes, remember the 15 minutes. Okay? So in nine minutes, you're done. But it doesn't matter unless after the nine minutes, you put something in there that jogs that kid and makes them apply it. When you see Bugsy, you'll go, oh, that's what the aide's been talking about all this time. You ready? We done? Any last questions before I kick you out? So the chapters two and three of the YouTube you are doing you need to come back in here, A, to sit and read, because forcing you back in here, you know, forces you to read. Please come. I'll be here. You know, the, you know why, right? He can't leave until the tarp comes and gets him, and that's 730. So I'm here, kid. Okay? I'm here. You need to come back in because you read it, you've got an idea, you can't get it into, you know, the picture chart, you can't see how you could do that, and you need to bounce it off somebody, could be me, could be her, please come back. Okay? But if you're the kind of person who needs to have that time and space, and you see this, oh God, do you see this in schools? That kid who is so smart that he has or she has no social skills, Mary, am I talking truth here? That oh yeah. Kid, that kid up going to a corner of the room, don't bother me. Am I talking truth, Mary? Yes. You know, you spot them all the time. If you're that kind of kid, fine. I want to see you thinking. I don't want to see regurgitation. I've seen enough regurgitation in my life. Okay? I want to see you thinking. That got everybody covered? Love you. Please come back. But if you don't want to come back, it's okay. It's okay. Mary, again, I apologize for the problem with the sound. When I put it back up, I will edit that. So, it, you know, you don't have dead air for the first, what was it, about 15 minutes? It was about that, yes. Now, could you at least see what I was doing? Yeah, I could see. Now, um, here during one of the videos, the screen froze. Okay. And since then, when I refreshed it, I've been able to hear you, but I haven't been able to see anything that you've been doing for like the last 15 minutes. So. Okay. What I'll do is, because uh, I've, I've, I can go in here and convert the collaborate recording to an MP4. Okay. And MP4, and I can do anything I want with it. You know, I can go in, I can edit it. If I have to talk back over it again, I can do that. So I'll do that. But I think you were able to stick pretty well with me tonight. Oh yes, yes. Yep. Okay, babe. All right. Anything, thank you. Anything you need, just let me know. And if you want to have a side conversation about that other class, let me know. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.